Good afternoon and welcome to the Senior Moment. This is Connie Clark with Home Helpers. And this afternoon in the studio with me, I have Dr. Denning. Um, he is the new rheumatologist in town, is that correct? That's correct. Um, and you're part of Kootenai Rheumatology and Internal Medicine, is correct, it? Correct, yeah. Okay over on uh, near the hospital yes so welcome thank you thanks for having me uh now i know you're new to town and i believe your wife is in your practice also so can you kind of tell us about yourself yeah i actually grew up north of spokane in uh chatteroy went oh, to okay. riverside high school local boy yeah so i spent the last nine years in med school and training so at um, michigan state i was there for the last five years and uh, met my wife in med school and she's actually from missouri so I talked her into coming out this way with me. Very good. Well, welcome. Um, okay, now tell me, what is rheumatology? Well, it's just a specialty that's devoted to um, issues with the joints. So and we also see, uh, we see rheumatoid arthritis, gout, lupus, uh, fibromyalgia, so a wide variety of, you know, joint complaints that cause pain. So when I hurt, you're the one I would come to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what do you see... Most, I mean, we're called a senior moment, so yeah, we talk a lot about senior issues in here, but what condition do you see most? Probably osteoarthritis. Uh, that's the most common arthritis out there. So even in my patients that have rheumatoid or gout or what I'm, you know, what they're initial re initially referred for, you know, the majority of them have a little osteoarthritis as well, so. What causes that? Uh, it's, it's, we don't really know for sure. It's um, probably, you know, I think it, it runs in families, people that, um, have bad osteoarthritis, usually no family members that had it as well, and, and uh, but we don't really know a cause. Is that something that you foresee being more prevalent as we become more sedentary in our lifestyles? Absolutely, or yeah. We know that osteoarthritis gets better with, with diet and exercise and keeping you know, your body, um, you know, obesity is a, is, a, is a risk factor for developing osteoarthritis, so of course it's important to be active. To, to Why would that be? Is that because it limits your movement? Well, you're just or? putting more stress on the joints, you know, especially, you know, knees. If you're if you're 100 pounds overweight, then you're gonna you're gonna uh, reduce your joint space even more than than you know losing cartilage in the process of developing osteoarthritis. And what kind of things, so far as diet, affect that? Um, we don't really have, you know, as far as slowing down the progression of osteoarthritis, we don't really know. Um, you know, dietary restrictions that make, make the process slow down. We know that, you know, eating a, eating a diet that helps you not become obese would be, you know, the best way to go. So diets low in simple sugars, you know, lean meats, vegetables, things like that. Would a high protein diet that would um, bring about more muscle mass help Absolutely, or not yeah. necessarily? Absolutely, yeah. You want to eat a balanced diet. You don't want to, you know, concentrate as much on eating high protein. You want a good balanced diet with, with adequate amounts of protein. Um, and of course, diet and exercise. Weight bearing exercise is important, and, and weight bearing doesn't mean going out and pumping iron. It just means your own body weight, and you know, walking around and doing activity with that, and it helps the muscle strengthen around the joints. And someone had told me that arthritis is an autoimmune disease. It can be osteoarthritis isn't known to be an autoimmune disease, but uh, rheumatoid arthritis and gout, uh, or sorry, rheumatoid arthritis um, and lupus and things like that are autoimmune diseases. And what is that? Tell me what autoimmune means. So it's your immune system's attack on you. And we don't really know why it happens. We think, we know it runs in families. So there's a genetic, uh, a genetic role there. And then also there's probably triggers in the environment, which we have theories on. Everybody's theories are different. So stressful things, traumatic things, uh, uh, gender differences. So uh, females get more autoimmune disease than males, whether that's hormone related or whether that's something that's maybe on an X chromosome. Females have two X chromosomes, men only have one. So we don't know for, we don't know for sure, but um, it's probably two hits. You probably are predisposed and then you meet some trigger in your environment and it causes it to start. So your body actually causes you to come down with it. Yeah, yeah, it, And it's fighting against each other. Exactly. Interesting. Right. Um, now I know that there's been a lot of talk about fibromyalgia. Correct. Um, what causes that? We don't know the reason for that either. Fibromyalgia is an interesting um, disease, and it's we're just starting to kind of un uncover, uh, you know, what what makes it start. Uh, it's probably 
at a molecular level with neurotransmitters. We think that there's more pro-pain uh, uh, signals in people's uh, uh, cerebral spinal fluid. So it's probably a, a, a dysregulation of something in that matter. We know that they have uh, exaggerated responses to pain, so some of the researchers in, in fibromyalgia will actually hook people up to MRIs, functional MRIs, and look at their response to even just light touch, and they have a much much more exaggerated response to that. That MRI lights up um, with you know with what what feels like you know what's a touch to them feels like a punch to us type of thing. So, wow. Yeah. So it's just everything's kind of hyped up. And is that something that runs in families too? You or? know, that's uh, that's an arg that's a good argument. I I think that um, I see a lot of fa I see a lot of people out there that have family members with fibromyalgia. So maybe. I don't know if it's an environmental thing or if it's actually a, a genetic thing, but it does seem to run in families. Have you been seeing a lot more of that or um, not necessarily? It just kind of runs in bunches. I see it just depends kind of on the week, but, you know, fibromyalgia, I'll see a bunch of cases all at once and then I won't see it for a while. And so it kind of, but I think overall there's the, the incidence of fibromyalgia is probably increasing. So What can you do about that? Uh, medication. I think, you know, medications are there. The, the best thing, people with fibromyalgia don't sleep, and so the, the, the medications that I use for fibromyalgia are all to help people get deep sleep. We need them to get into delta sleep, which is the restorative sleep when they wake up and they feel like they've actually rested. People with fibro often are only getting sleep in two or three hour bunches, so they, they never actually reach that deep sleep, and we use medications to get them there. And then once they start feeling better, getting more rest, they actually need to get more active. And, you know, that's not strenuous activity. That's just getting out and moving. A lot of times I have them, uh, you know, start physical therapy. We have uh, access to warm pools around this area. Um, and I think they do well in the pool because it takes gravity out of the equation. And most people with arthritis like a warm bath or a warm shower in the morning. And they really do respond well in the pool. And when you mentioned the warm water and the warm bath, could the opposite then be true? Because I know... You know, my aunt used to say she could tell it was going to rain because her knee would start hurting right. or, or, you know, something like I that. I hear that a lot, too. So yeah. would that, the opposite be true that? Yeah, I think, you know, I, a lot of people like to go to Arizona in the warm areas in the wintertime because they, they, they do better in the warm temperatures in Arizona. is not, not a lot of humidity. And I always ask when I'm, when I'm, a long weekend's coming up, I ask my patients how the weather's going to be for the weekend because they're usually better, <laughs> better than the weathermen, so. Yeah, because. If thinking the warm would help, then maybe the cold wouldn't. Yeah, I think so. And I think that the changes in the pressures in the atmosphere really make a difference in the joints, too. Uh, when you mention pressure, would yeah. that mean that up here I would hurt more than maybe further south? Yeah, or? when we, you know, I spent my last nine years taking care of people in the Midwest, and we get, you know, there's more humidity there than there is here. And, and especially the changes when a storm was rolling in, you know, we'd, I'd always see more people with, with acute, you know, flare-ups in their joint disease. So it d definitely does play a role. You said that triggered something in me because I used to live in South Florida, and mm -hmm. we used to have the hurricanes come in, and the pressure right. would go crazy, you know, when the hurricanes could come in. So that would affect someone then. Yeah, I think it those. does. And I, it's, you start to believe things when you hear it from multiple patients. So I think it's pretty consistent. Interesting. Um, and one of the other things you said that you treat a lot of is lupus. I mm -hmm. don't know a lot about that. What yeah. is that? It's an autoimmune disease as well. It's, it's more of a systemic disease, meaning that it can involve pretty much any organ. So we not only see joint complaints, but we see, uh, we see involvement of the brain, the kidneys, the heart and lungs. So it's, it can be a very severe disease. And, it, and the majority of what I see is rather mild cases of it. But it's a syndrome with 11 criteria and you need four criteria to meet to meet the diagnosis and what are those so you have lab different lab tests you can do probably most common is the ANA so that's one of the criteria what is ANA uh, it's anti-nuclear antibodies so um, it's actually a blood test we can order and it's just it shows your body's making antibodies against a part of your cell which is the nucleus and it's very it's probably the most common antibody that we order and it's associated with a lot of so it's not specific it's sensitive so you know lupus 90 plus percent of people have a positive ANA rheumatoid arthritis probably around 30 percent 
psoriatic arthritis, and it's associated with thyroid disease and Raynaud's. So it's lab and then skin disorders. So these folks always get worsening of their disease when they're, when they're, when they're in the sunshine, so sun sensitivity. The malar rash, which is the butterfly rash that you probably have seen in magazines and books. What it's is actually that? on the face. It looks like a butterfly across the face, redness. And, and there's discoid lesions, which are actually circular lesions that actually can leave scars on the skin. Um, joint pain, uh, fluid around the heart and lungs, kidney involvement, which we call nephritis, which is inflammation in the kidneys, ultimately leading to sometimes end-stage renal disease and people having to be on dialysis. And, you know, that's lupus is, you know, the people who do really bad are the ones that get kidney involvement. So the reason people pass away from lupus is probably number one is infection, and then number two would be the kidney involvement. It can be very severe. So, And then they also they can develop seizures and Pretty much everybody with lupus complains of cognitive problems. Like I walked into a room and I can't remember why I'm there, or they even are mid, you know, mid sentence and forget what they and forget what they were even trying to say. Uh, and it's it's worrisome when they're noticing it, but when then when you got husband or wife there too, and they're saying they're just not themselves. They're you know they're not making sense and they're not remembering things. I wonder if because there was is a cognitive. Um, piece of it yeah. if maybe folks with dementia could also have that but you not really know it because they've right. also got dementia right yeah it's true and and there's you know some of us that think that maybe alzheimer's and, and dementia may be an autoimmune thing too but you know i haven't read much on that so but um you just wonder why some people get disease some diseases and some don't you know why is but so it's interesting but yeah you get when you have you know, somebody that has a, an underlying uh, neurologic disorder like dementia and they develop something like that, you'd, it'd be hard to know what's, what's actually going on. Because a lot of times they may not understand what's happening and can't communicate. Right. No, that'd be, and horribly frustrating, yeah. Interesting. Very interesting. Um, so is all of the things that, that a rheumatologist would address muscle disorders or is it actually with like bones yeah we see muscle disorders too so fibromyalgia myalgia means you know pain in the muscles so but there's no actually laboratory data that there's being any damage done we do see things like what we call polymyositis and dermatomyositis which are actually inflammation in the muscles and usually people get inflammation in the proximal muscles meaning muscles close to their core so usually it's um in the thighs and you notice it by not being able to climb stairs, not being able to get off the toilet, not being able to get off a chair, so profound weakness. And we actually see uh, evidence that their muscles are actually dying on their blood work. They get uh, CPK elevations on their, on their You can see that on blood work, that yeah. your muscles are dying? Yeah. So. Wow. Like if somebody were to, you know, some of the older population, if they fall at home, a lot of times we get them and... Um, CPK or muscle enzymes, if they lay on the floor with no, with no help for six, seven hours, those muscles start to break down, ultimately leading to kidney failure. So it can be very serious. Interesting. Yeah. I didn't know that. Um, so do you deal then with um, disorders concerning the bones too? Yeah, we deal with osteoporosis and osteopenia, which is very common, especially in our folks. So rheumatoid arthritis and all inflammatory arthritis is a risk factor for thinning of the bones over time. Not to mention, you know, the other risk factors for osteoporosis like heavy alcohol and tobacco smoke, female, uh, family history of especially not only osteoporosis but um, family history of hip fracture and things like that. So and we manage those as well. Good grief. So all of, <laughs> all of your conditions that you treat are hurt. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right, exactly. Yeah. You know, versus a different kind of doctor where you've got a cut or something sure. like that. You deal with all the things that make your body hurt. Exactly. And, that, and I think pain is the worst symptom of any disease. So it's very rewarding to make people feel better. I mean, people don't, I mean, people, of course, care about their cholesterol, but having high cholesterol doesn't hurt when you're... No, it doesn't. That's what I was right. thinking. It, you so. know, there, there are diseases like heart disease and stuff like that that yeah. not necessarily hurts. Exactly. But when you can't move and your body right. hurts, right. you know, how would you know? Okay, let me ask a stupid question here. How would you know if it hurt when you moved your body, if there was really something wrong or if you were just coming down with the flu and you had body ache? Sure. You know what I mean? 
Yeah, I, th I think a lot of our arthritis has come on quick, like the flu would come on. Um, you, the biggest symptom of inflammatory arthritis is stiffness. So osteoarthritis will give you, when you wake up in the morning, 10, 15 minutes of stiffness where you have to do your stretches and, and it takes a while to get moving. People with rheumatoid and psoriatic arthritis usually take hours, you know, sometimes to get loosened up. I mean, so they spend half their morning stretching, doing all their little routine to get themselves loosened up. So prolonged morning stiffness is always worrisome. And then osteoarthritis joints swell, but um, not to the extent of some of the inflammatory things I see. So especially involvement of the knuckles, um, you start to worry about things like rheumatoid arthritis. So stiffness and swelling. Uh, and you mentioned different types of arthritis. What are those different types and what's the differences between them? Biggest difference between, you know, rheumatoid arthritis only involves the upper part of the cervical spine. So it doesn't involve thoracic spine and, and lumbar spine, which is mid-back and low-back. Um, so it would just be things like in your arms and your hands and right. all that, not your knees. Well, 90% 90, 90 plus of rheumatoid folks get hand involvement and okay. probably somewhere close to that knee involvement. So it's usually the uh, distal joints or the joints, we say axial and uh, then peripheral. So it's the peripheral joints, axial is the spine. So Rheumatoid likes the hands, it likes the knees, it likes the feet, it likes... Um, the things like, that move a lot. Exactly, yeah, yeah, and small joints, large joints. Uh, and then you get into some of the, what we call spondylar arthropathies, which include uh, reactive arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, and arthritis associated with uh, inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis that can help cause arthritis. And those involve the spine, and they really like what we call the sacroiliac joints, which is where the spine joins the pelvis, and they get inflammation in there. And a lot of times people go years with every morning I wake up and I have kind of stiffness in the, you know, almost mid-buttock, and uh, people go years for that. But it's actually sacroiliitis, and it ultimately those can lead to fusion of the spine. And I've seen people that have had that for 30, 40, 50 years that can't look side to side and actually, you know, walk walk looking down they can't even raise they kind of raise their eyes at you but can't move their head up and that's probably one in a hundred people so odds are you know somebody with that is there anything you can do for that yeah we use similar medications that we use for rheumatoid arthritis for those spondyl arthropathies too and in this in this in the case of the crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis if we treat the crohn's and ulcerative colitis a lot of times we use the same medications we would for the arthritis the arthritis gets better so it goes as the as the bowels go Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to take a break, but I want to continue talking because, unfortunately, I resemble a lot of these things you're talking about. Mm -hmm. so, so we will be right back. Okay. Cool. <laughs> um, I'm going to continue along those lines. Is there anything you, you particularly like to talk about? You didn't buy anything. Yeah. So what are you... And let's see if we can put the microphone a little, okay. move it a little closer. If you if you want to lean back, you can move it over to me. Okay. Okay. Let's do that too. Okay. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. And we're back again. This is Connie Clark with Home Helpers, and we're on the senior moment. And I'm talking with Dr. Denning. He is a rheumatologist and internal medicine with Kootenai, and we've been talking about all the different kinds of things that make your body hurt. And I was telling telling him uh, during the break, unfortunately, I resemble a lot of the things we're talking about here. So I'm really interested in finding out not only what they are and why I feel like this, but what can I do so I don't hurt in the morning, you know, when I get up and, and it takes me 10, 15 minutes to kind of get my body moving. And, and I've heard that comment from other folks where it takes a little while to kind of get my body in gear, you know, in the morning. 
but that's really not a normal thing or should be a normal right. thing, correct? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that as we age, we're going to be more stiff when we wake up. You know, it depends on what we've done to our bodies throughout the years. A lot of us have played sports and things, and it's sometimes difficult to get up in the morning. And But st- stiffness, I think the biggest thing is to uh, make sure that you maintain your flexibility. So I think everybody should have, that, it, that does get up stiff, should have some sort of a stretching routine that they do in the morning, and they do it consistently. And I think you know, a great thing to do is get, get up and get right in the bathtub or in the shower and get loosened up and even do your stretches in the shower. So, oh, that's an interesting yeah. thought. Yeah. Yeah. Cause the warm does make you feel better and it kind of wakes you up too. Right. right. And I had my, my program director in fellowship every morning he got up and jumped in his hot tub. So it'd be oh, nice that if we could sounds all have rough. that. Yeah. <laughs> that, that would be fun. <laughs> um, one of the things you also mentioned was that you deal with gout. Yeah. What is that? So gout is a accumulation over time of uh, uric acid crystals. So uric acid crystals under a microscope look like needles. So if you get those in your joint, obviously needles in your joint are going to hurt. And usually what happens is um, people get attack, attacks in their big toe. So that we call that podagra. And that first joint in your big toe gets lit up with crystals. And it probably is the most painful of any arthritis I see. So it gets really red, hot. Usually it happens at night. Uh, and why it happens at night is that uric acid likes to crystallize in colder temperatures. So it's colder at night. Your body temperature goes down. Your toes are obviously the most co- you know, most coldest part of your body, and you get a, get an attack. But it can, over time, if you let it go and don't treat it, and you can get what we call chronic gouty arthritis, which is literally gout nonstop in every joint. So... And if we were to get somebody who had, had gout for 20 years and actually even pull fluid off of a joint that's not even having problems, they probably have uric acid crystals in there just waiting to. Well, how do you stop uric acid then? Yeah, it's, it's dietary restrictions. So things that are high in uric acid include uh, meats, so especially organ meats, cultures that eat uh, liver and brain, uh, processed foods, uh, alcohol. So of all the alcohols, beer is the worst. So it, it contains something called guanosine which actually is converted into uric acid. So, really? So beer and then uh, probably liquor is, you know, hard liquor would be the, the next culprit, and then uh, and wine is probably the best for you. But as long as you're doing that, you know, I, the people that I see with bad gout are usually the, the heavy drinkers. So uh, also uh, seafood. Seafood's kind of a, a high, is high in uric acid as well. So cultures that eat a lot of seafood eat a lot of red meat have higher incidences of gout. When you say seafood, are we talking fish or shellfish or it doesn't matter? It doesn't matter. And when I get gout people, they can always tell me exactly what makes them flare. So they've got it figured out by then. Turkey is always a culprit. So I always get people after Thanksgiving saying, hey, I, my gout was going crazy. And some people know exactly what, what triggers it. I did this or I did that. And so if if we stop eating or drinking those things, does it reduce the amount of uric acid right. in our body? Right. So normal uric acid should be around four or five. Anything greater than six, you have the tendency or have the possibility of developing gout. So by dietary restrictions alone, you can drop your uric acid one to two. So um, if you're eight, you can drop yourself down to that level, hopefully below six. If you can't, some people have uric acids 12 or 13. A lot of times they need medication to uh, help their bodies get rid of the uric acid. Is that when you get your normal yearly uh, exam and they do the blood test on you, is that something they normally test for or do you have to request it? No, we uh, we don't. There's lots of people running around with high uric acid levels. So uric acid, prob- people run around with, with high uric acids for probably 10 to 20 years before they get a gout attack. And there's no recommendation currently to treat somebody who has high uric acid but no gout um, yet. So we're and we're there's also arguments that high uric acid causes other diseases like uh, coronary artery disease. That's so what I was going to ask. Is right. is that bad if it's not hurting your joints to have that? Right. Well, we we don't know yet. We're it's the verdict is out. We, I we know that uric acid actually raises blood pressure, and it may be one of the one of the reasons from an evolutionary standpoint that we're upright. So we're one of the only animals that doesn't break down uh, uric acid. So uric acid actually constricts the vessels a bit and helps us maintain our blood pressure so we can be upright. So the other, one of the other animals is actually a Dalmatian dog. Doesn't make your, doesn't make a uricase is what we call it. And your uh, Dalmatians get gout. So 
Is that the only canine yeah, that I does? Yeah, th- I think that's the only canine. I think like apes and things don't make a uricase either. We actually have a new medication out that's a, that's a uricase that brings down uric acid all the way to undetectable levels. So, wow. And that's for people that have had gout for years and years and are actually having uh, things called TOFI, which are actually soft tissue accumulations of gouty crystals. And you can get those on anywhere that you had potential to traumatize, like elbows and fingers. And I've seen some horrible TOFI. So, so if you keep your feet warm at night, would that? Potentially. I mean, that'd be. Because <laughs> my feet are always cold exactly. and I've always got socks on or something. Right. right. You know. So, yeah, I, potentially. Yeah. But I think if you're, if you have high uric acid levels, you know, for 10, 20 years, you're, it's just a matter of time before you actually develop your first attack. And then there's the, probably there, there's people out there that have your higher uric acids their whole life and never develop an attack. So we don't really know why for sure that it happens, but. And you said it, it starts in your toe and what is it just pain? Oh, it's or? excruciating pain. It's compared to giving birth, uh, kidney stones and gout. Those are the three most painful <laughs> things I've, I've heard said and I haven't had any of them. So. I wouldn't know, but those are, those three things are always on the same level of pain, patient-wise. So, yeah, okay. women have said I'd rather I'd rather give birth than have a gout attack. Interesting. So yeah. Okay, now since we're down on the feet, right? Um, and we've been talking about muscles and and conditions dealing with that. What about Charlie horses? Charlie horses are so common in I know in my <laughs> folks. Yes, especially at night and. Uh, you know, I think as you age, you're at higher risk of that. We don't really know why they occur. I mean, electrolyte abnormalities, so um, low magnesium, low potassium can contribute to, to clotting. So it's always reasonable to get that blood work checked, especially if you're on medications that predispose you to low potassium and things like that, like the diuretics. A lot of people are on Lasix and hydrochlorothiazide and things like that. Uh, but um, the main thing is to stay dehydrated. And that's what I tell my folks, you know, even if you have to drink drink water close to bedtime. Some people uh, swear by tonic water. So just a, you know, an eight ounce glass of tonic water before bedtime. Some people supplement with a little extra magnesium, which is pretty safe. Uh, your body gets, gets rid of what it doesn't need. So magnesium kind of has a relaxing effect on, on the muscles and it's actually used for blood pressure and other things. And so magnesium is a reasonable option. So if you took a suppl- supplement of magnesium, that might... Yeah, potentially. Okay. Yeah, especially if, it, you know, people that really suffer from it and it's waking their waking them up from sleep because so. sometimes at night mine just go crazy in yeah. my feet and it's like ah so yeah, I, yeah. I didn't know if it like that's why i wanted to know what does gout feel like versus yeah know. i think you'd know okay that'd be the only way to to describe <laughs> it and i think that a lot of people have restless leg syndrome too and that you know that's kind of a can be a sensation of cramping where they just have to move their legs and we have good medications for that too and that affects a lot of people's sleep and, and again, going back to the fibromyalgia and the lack of the sleep and the whole... Yeah, right. No, it's a, it's a cycle, you know, a pain cycle. People that, that don't sleep don't, don't want to do stuff during the day, and then they, by not doing stuff, they're not tired when they go to bed at night, and, and it's just a vicious cycle where more pain, no sleep, no sleep, more pain type of thing. So I always draw a circle with my fibromyalgia patients, and I tell them somewhere we're going to have to break this cycle. So get them moving and get them sleeping and they usually do much better. Um, and one of the things you, we also kind of touched on earlier was osteoporosis. Right. Um, and that is something that is preventable, isn't it? Yeah, to a, to a point. I think people that uh, have a family history of it are definitely at higher risk. You, you can prevent it to a point. Um, you know, I always tell people tobacco use, big risk factor, alcohol use, heavy alcohol use is a risk factor. Uh, so eliminate those if you can. Uh, Weight-bearing exercise is very important. So we, I see more osteoporosis, and, you know, it's more common in females, and it's more common in, in thin females. So having a little bit of extra muscle mass, um, you know, to support the joints, and, and it actually does prevent osteoporosis. So it's a good thing I have a little bit of weight on me? Is that what you're yeah, saying? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's a good. Okay. All right. I don't want, I don't want to be real thin. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that works. Um, because as we grow older, I mean – Sometimes you just think, okay, pain is just a normal thing that I should experience as I get older. Mm-hmm. But that, not, that isn't necessarily the case. Right. And I get that a lot in my patients. Somebody who's probably had arthritis you know, problems for 10, 20 years and just didn't go to the doctor to get evaluated. And, you, and I see that more than I'd like to. 
even, you know, osteoarthritis is probably the most difficult thing to treat, but we still have some options that can really lower pain levels. Like what? Um, we use, you know, I kind of progress. Good old-fashioned Tylenol arthritis is a nice, safe drug as long as you don't use too much of it. Uh, and then uh, NSAIDs, so non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Some of those you can get over the counter, like aspirin, ibuprofen, naproxen. Uh, and then we can, you know, get more aggressive. Sometimes people, I think, have a little bit, you know, there's a fine line between there's osteoarthritis, which pretty much everybody gets, and then there's something called erosive osteoarthritis, which actually not only eats away at the cartilage, but it eats away at the bones. And we can actually see what we call erosions on x-ray. And I think that might be a form of inflammatory arthritis, so something simpler in a rheumatoid. So there's, and when I get people with really bad deformities in their hands and feet, you start to worry about that. Is there something, this, it's just too much to be osteoarthritis, just oste osteoarthritis. So a lot of times we'll treat those people with drugs for rheumatoid and they do great. What causes, because I have seen that, I have seen seniors where their hands, their fingers are, are yeah. changing direction exactly. yeah. for lack of a better description. Right. What causes that to happen? Well, just, just the lack of the joint space over time. So you lose cartilage and then you you're pretty much become bone on bone. So a lot of people that have, you know, for, for example, one, one leg shorter than the other, a lot of times they'll have bad osteoarthritis where they're actually bone on bone in one knee and then they have pretty much normal normal joint space in the other knee. So you, you start to compensate, your body starts to compensate for that, you know, shorter leg. And same with the fingers, you lose, you know, you do x-rays and you can't even see that, you know, where the joint is, you, it's completely lost. They're, you're, you're bone touching bone and that leads to more deformities. So it's off balance, so to speak. Correct. Yeah. And then as you get, you know, os osteoarthritic hands actually get a lot of lumpy bumpies on them. And mm -hmm. then tendons glide over bones. And if the tendons can't glide over a lumpy bumpy joint, they slide off to the side. And then that causes the fingers to go funny ways. Oh, interesting. So, yeah. Because I have seen that a lot. And right. then I've seen where people have um, different, for lack of the word, different kinds of ring apparatus on their finger mm -hmm. that makes the fingers go back the other direction. Um, what does that stretch the muscles? Yeah, I haven't seen much of that, but yeah, I, I think the theory behind that would be to, is, is to probably stretch the muscles and try and maintain the joint. You know, I use a lot of braces and things from, from in my practice, especially, you know, the most common complaint is a lot of thumb pain. So that's a very common spot to get uh, osteoarthritis. Uh, probably 90% plus of females get it and 80% plus of males get it, you know, before they pass. So, um, it's, you know, and we obviously need our thumbs. It's what makes us, you know, one of the things that makes us human beings. Just but have a bandaid on your thumb and try exactly. to do something. Yeah. But yeah, a lot of times I'll get braces that have a good, you know, good metal, uh, base to them that prevents people from, from doing stuff that's going to potentially injure their thumbs or make it worse. And osteoarthritis is one of those things where it hurts more if you do more. So. So you don't want to do more. Yeah. And then it's a vicious cycle there too. Yeah. So, we're yeah. going around that circle again. Right. So, so it's not normal to hurt. Right. Okay. And you see, sometimes you see people where they're shrinking. Sure. Now, is that their bones aren't actually shrinking, then it's the space. Between. Yeah. Between. Between the bones. And we actually see, especially osteoporosis people, you know, that lose the, lose the actual height. They lose height. So I asked some of them, you know, how tall were you in high school? How tall are you now? Well, I'm two or three inches shorter. And then you start to worry about osteoporosis. And then, you know, the, the back is commonly involved in osteoporosis, as, as are mo most joints. But they actually get what we call compression fractures, where the vertebrae actually crumble. And you know, obviously that can be very, very painful. And as you get more and more of those, you end up with the, the loss of the curve of your lumbar spine and your thoracic spine curves the other way. And then you get what, you, what the spine starts to look a little bit like a question mark. And people, you know, are walking with their heads looks pointing at the ground. Right. Yeah. I've seen that. So. Interesting. Well, we're going to continue this conversation. Um, so we will be right back. Okay. So we will be right back. Okay. We'll be right back. 
And Oscar has that. I think he's part of the treatment group. Oscar Schneider. Yeah. And we're back. Welcome back to the Senior Moment. Again, this is Connie Clark with Home Helpers, and I have Dr. Denning with the Kootenai um, Rheumatology right. and Internal Medicine. Ah, I'm having <laughs> to try to learn these new big words, you know. Um, and we've been talking about some of the treatment options that people have for being in pain. You know, we think that, at least I do, that as you get older, you're just in pain, and that's the way it is. But that's not necessarily how it should be. And you were talking about there's some new treatments available. Right. Yeah, we just got a new drug for rheumatoid arthritis. It's actually uh, just approved a couple weeks ago. Uh, it's, it's, it has its role. It's called Zeljans, and but we have lots of new medications for rheumatoid arthritis. A lot of people are, you know, we're putting people in the remission with these newer drugs. You know, 20, 30 years ago, we, we were limited in our, in our treatment. We had prednisone and we had gold and things that, you know, have quite a bit of side effects. And then we started to develop, you know, things called disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs and things like methotrexate, uh, plaquenil, sulfasalazine, uh, obviously safer than gold, safer than prednisone. And now we have new drugs, which are called biologics. They're not super new, but within the last 10 to 20 years, and drugs like Humira, Enbrel. Uh, I've seen that advertised. Right, you see right. a lot of drug companies now that are advertising on the television. Sure. And I... That's kind of interesting, right. you know, to well, educate the uh, sure. consumer on what's out there. Exactly. And now we have celebrities with diseases like psoriatic arthritis. We have Phil Mickelson, who is a, a great golfer, pro golfer, that's on a drug called Enbrel, which is a biologic drug. Uh, he, uh, he was diagnosed with psoriatic arthritis two or three years back, and uh, so he, he's doing very well, obviously. On, what is on a drug. biologic drug? So biologic drugs work on the immune system, and they work on it in different ways. So they actually interfere with with signals from, from, your, from the autoimmune system into the inflammatory system that tell the inflammatory system to make, to make inflammation. So we have a bunch of those signals we can block. Uh, and we keep so it keeps your body from fighting itself. Exactly, okay. right, right. And that the, you, you have a little bit of increased risk of infection with those. So we, we monitor for that closely. We never would give these drugs to somebody who has infection. So we always tell them to skip their dose if they're on antibiotics or if they're not feeling themselves. Uh, but that's usually only about 2% of people out on those drugs that get more infections. And people with autoimmune disease in general get more infections too. So a lot of people get less infections, which is, which is interesting. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Do you think that because us baby boomers are now getting older, that they're going to really be focusing more on these kinds of things because all of us are going to start experiencing this stuff? Right, and that would make the most sense. And some of these drugs, we're talking $20,000 plus a year if you were to pay cash for them. A lot of the companies help out with copay assistance and with um, people who can't afford the drugs, but you know that the pharmaceutical companies are of course going to target that baby boomer population, and they're suffering from arthritis because that's they're, we're getting to, they're getting to that age. So I see more and more drugs down the line. You know, we just had a new rheumatoid drug, and it seems like we're getting those every couple of years. Yeah, we seem to be driving a lot of things as we get older. Exactly, right. <laughs> what is the youngest patient you've seen um, with these kind of conditions? Yeah, that's a good point. I see, kid, I see kids all the time. Um, yeah, uh, I have in my practice, I haven't been doing it for very long, and I have probably, probably 10 kids. And some of them have pretty significant disease. You can get rheumatoid arthritis as a child, and I have, I have a patient like that. So, you know, it's... it's uh, you wouldn't even, I don't think I would associate arthritis with a child. Yeah, That's right, really strange. Right. And the, the immune system can act up at any age. And so we don't see it as often in kids, thank God, but um, we do see it. And we treat it similar. We treat it like we would treat an adult. But uh, it can be, be difficult for, patient, or for parents to recognize, too. You know, that, yeah, because kids are always, always trying to get out of going exactly. to school. My stomach hurts, my leg hurts, my arm right. hurts, whatever. And you go, yeah, yeah, go to school. Exactly, right. You know, so how would you know that there was... It's hard. Yeah. The, it, parents usually notice it, but just with the kid, with the, their child's just not walking the same or, or, or not doing their normal activities the way they used to do them. And of course, with pain, you get some withdrawal and they don't want to play with their friends and depression and, and things like that. And then obviously the joints swell just like they would in an adult. So we see, you know, kids usually get involvement of the knees and they get involvement of the hands. But um, yeah, so... So what's the youngest good. age? I, the youngest I've seen probably ever is maybe five years old. Oh, so. my yeah. heavens. Yeah. 
That would really be hard because right. there's they're still growing exactly. I mean, you know right and then you get you can get neo neonates babies that uh you know are born the mothers with autoimmune disease and they sometimes can be born with complications from that and you know lu- the patients with lupus really have a lot of them have difficulty bringing babies to term they have problems with miscarriages because they have sometimes uh you know disorders where they clot off blood flow to the placenta and they can miscarry and a lot of them miscarry you know later on in pregnancy mid mid pregnancy late pregnancy so it can be very difficult a lot of times if i when i'm interviewing somebody and investigating possible lupus i'll ask them if they've had many miscarriages so a lot of times there's there's been a lot so if you've had a lot of miscarriages in turn would you then be tested for that you'd start to you'd start to you know you'd see somebody that specializes in in people that are high risk for having miscarriages and then that would be need to be investigated I don't have much experience with that, but yeah, the, you'd you'd start to wonder if you know if maybe that was the cause. Exactly of it. right, right. Especially if you you know you have other symptoms of lupus and and if you uh, have family history. Good grief! Yet, you know, I always learn so much talking to people here, and sometimes it's things I really didn't want to know. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Right. Right. And the I, I, good thing is we, this stuff is rare that we're talking about with kids. You know, we see it more in adults, which which isn't much better, but it's, you know. But, I mean, we're still a small community. So exactly. even that many children, just think of how many there are right. in the world right. like that that right. we don't even know. Yeah, and they actually have pediatric rheumatologists. We need more of them, but they, there's people that just see kids with rheumatologic disorders. And most rheumatologists, adult rheumatologists, rotate through, you know, a few couple months of, of pediatric rheumatology and there's there's people out there with you know practices full of kids that's scary mm-hmm. a- and you wonder you know we've talked on this show before about nutrition and how our diets have changed and how our level of activity has changed now we all sit in front of a computer sure. or in front of the games you know and you wonder is that what's causing a lot of this stuff to happen or if it was there before we just never recognized it like Right. Uh, you know, That's Alzheimer's, it was, you right. know, he's just crazy or, you know, sure. senile. And, and now you find out it's Alzheimer's. So you wonder if it was around back then and no one. Yeah, probably was. Yeah, it's hard to know. We see, you know, if you look at, it's interesting to sometimes look, we have something called polymyalgia rheumatica, which people, you know, over, over 50, 60 years old get. And they, it's also called rheumatism. And people, you know, you look at death certificates from, early on 1800s and people passed away from rheumatism now we treat it we have prednisone and it works very well to treat that but but prednisone has its own exactly side effects right. too right so you know you can always i took it for a number of years for my asthma and you could always oh yeah take tell that someone uh-huh. was taking it by the round face right right you know and the nice thing about rheumatoid arthritis is it usually responds to lower doses of prednisone than say asthma so yeah a lot of times it's 10 milligrams or less will greatly decrease their symptoms same with polymyalgia rheumatica and a lot of sometimes i have to use higher doses but i'd say 10 milligrams usually is is enough for a lot of most of my stuff so when someone said they have rheumatism is that arthritis is that the same yeah it's 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 different than arthritis they don't get they get mainly weakness and severe pain in their shoulder girdle so up shoulder neck and they also get it in their hip girdle so and that's usually sudden onset so i went to bed and i was feeling fine and I woke up and I couldn't get myself out of bed. Oh, that's scary. Yeah. And then they, they, you order blood work and they have inflammatory markers. Sed rate is the, is the best example, you know, that are, that are five times, six times what they should be. And that, you know, it's a diagnosis. It's a clinical diagnosis, but that's always a helpful test. So, and that's, and that's commonly seen in an uh, in older population. It's interesting that you would have disorders of, lack of movement and you can take a blood test and find right right the culprit so our blood carries a whole lot of Absolutely. inflammation in it right when you're when you have inflammation you're you know you get proteins floating around and they stick to your red blood cells and that's what the said right is so uh you, we can it's not a very specific test i mean anything can cause a lot of things can cause an elevated said rate including infection and cancer and but of course arthritis can too so when you get a high said rate like that you you start to you start to investigate now, if you were thinking you had any of these conditions that we're talking about, is that something your 
general practitioner could test for, or would you have to go to a specialist? Oh, no. General practitioners, most of them feel very comfortable with ordering the blood work. Okay. And it's more of a screening. And general, generally, we have people get a SED rate and a CRP, which is another measure of inflammation, and then they I usually get a rheumatoid factor and, uh, and an ANA. So and that's, that's usually a pretty good screening. So then you would get this blood test from your doctor. Your doctor would see that you had these eleva- elevated results Correct. and then uh, refer you to yeah. a specialist yeah. in that. And there's quite a few uh, general practitioners and internists that feel comfortable managing early arthritis, and a lot of times they'll manage it themselves, and that's totally appropriate. You know, I, you know, I see, see more of the moderate to severe, and they see more of the mild to moderate, and that's fine. So your, your general practitioner could take care of things until it gets out of yeah, hand? Absolutely, until they feel uncomfortable with it, and then they send, you know, send a rheumatology. Because or... they're probably not familiar with all the new drugs. That right, are exactly. And, and that's, that. yeah, that's why there's a, a specialty completely devoted to these things and these new drugs. Well, and it's really sad that we, I'm sorry, but really sad but that we need doctors uh, like this. Right. But, you know... It's a good thing that we're learning all these causes for these conditions because I'm sure, again, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago, when you hurt, you just hurt. And that right. was being old. There right. wasn't anything that could make you feel better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know. So what would you suggest if I'm 40-ish, early 50s, and I don't want to hurt when I'm in my 60s, what should I do? I'd be active. So, you know not strenuous exercise, but get out and, and move, you know, walking is a great example and it's easy. We all can do it and we all have adequate area to do it. So, uh, and then, you know, keeping your, keeping your weight where you're where in your normal range. So eating appropriately, uh, and limiting simple sugars, which can be pro inflammatory, some think, and trying to eat lean meats, vegetables, um, seafood and trying to eat as balanced diet as you can. And stay away from the alcohol because you said alcohol beer is and tobacco. Right. That's really interesting. I I really didn't know that there was something in in beer that would cause gout. Right. I had never ever heard that before. Sure. Yeah. And tobacco smoke, you know, we found that is is actually as a risk factor for developing rheumatoid arthritis. So if you have a family history, and you know you're a smoker, you gotta. Or is it a smoker or a round smoke? Well, probably, I, don't, I haven't heard much about around smoke, but obviously smoking yourself would be put you at risk. And then the folks with rheumatoid arthritis, that's actually a risk factor for developing heart disease. So so it all kinds of... A, a smoking rheumatoid arthritis patient can get pretty dangerous. Good grief. Okay, so we have to live a hef- healthy lifestyle, uh, not too much meat and seafood. Right. Um, limit the alcohol the smoking, that sort of thing, and maybe we won't hurt as we get older. Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> um, if someone had more questions, how could they find out more information about this? Uh, rheumatology.org is very good. You know, we have internet now, so Google Google um, osteoarthritis. Google these arth- arthritic conditions, and there's a wealth of information out there. And if you are suffering from something like this, you can ask your doctor for a referral? Absolutely, yeah. And, and then they'd be contacting... Con- like. Yeah, contacting the Kootenai Physi- Physicians Clinic or, you know, whatever, wh- wherever a rheumatologist is close to you. you know, okay. Get in and see somebody. And if they wanted to ask questions, how would they get in contact with you? Uh, th- through, probably through Kootenai Physician Clinic would probably be the easiest way to go. Okay. Yeah. And what would be the number over there? I don't know what number they would call, actually. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, but they could go on the... Uh, KMC. Right, KMC and get all that information. Org and Absolutely. Find you. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Very good. Well, thank you so much for coming on with us today. And like all of the other shows that we have done, uh, we will be recording this and it will be available shortly online at uh, on YouTube or on CourtneyHomeCare.com. We'll have a copy and I'll provide you with a copy also. So um, people can hear all of this information because it is, you know, again, I resemble this. As we get older, we start hurting, and you think that's a normal thing. But like you said, that's not normal. Our right. bodies shouldn't hurt. Our hands shouldn't hurt, you know, from... They don't have to hurt. They don't yeah. have to hurt. Right. And there are things we can do. So I appreciate it. Thank you so much for being with me this afternoon. Thank you for having me. And you've been listening to The Senior Moment, and you all have a wonderful rest of your weekend. <laughs>